Welcome back to the Australian Rotary Health podcast called The Research Behind Lift a Lid. I'm Jessica Cooper and on episode 48, we will have two guests joining us today, Dr. Helen Parker and Isabel Young from the University of Sydney. Helen and Isabel were both on the research team of the late Professor Helen O'Connor, who received a mental health research grant from Australian Rotary Health in 2017 to 2018 for the project Reducing Body Dissatisfaction and Internalised Weight Stigma in Young Women with Obesity, the Everybody Study. Dr. Helen Parker is a dietitian dual qualified in exercise and sports science and is also an academic fellow at the University of Sydney. Isabel is an accredited practicing dietitian and is also currently completing a PhD under the supervision of Helen. So thank you very much, Helen and Isabel, for joining me on the podcast today. How have you both been? Oh, well, yeah, good. Coping yeah, with lockdown, good. but well. <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, so the Everybody Intervention aims to, to help improve body image in young women with obesity. Would you like to tell us a bit about what this intervention is and, and why this kind of program may be important for this particular group? Um, okay, I'll go yep. now. So young women are at a time of life when so much is changing. So they're finishing school, they're starting tertiary education or work or both, leaving the family home and many are fostering long-term relationships and perhaps even starting families. However, there's also a large proportion of young women uh, who experience overweight and obesity. Uh, and this group in particular, uh, for this group in particular, the mental health challenges that come with that increased body weight are particularly difficult. So the majority of um, weight management research has focused on middle-aged and older adults, um, as these groups are typically, you know, stable and easy to recruit into studies and will generally stay with a research project once they've signed up for it. But young women are different um, and they need programs tailored towards them and not tailored towards middle-aged people. So for young women, um, body image dissatisfaction or being unsatisfied with the appearance of one's body um, is common and it has significant problems associated with it. Um, and young women who have a lot of things on their time um, are attracted to quick fix or fad diets as a solution for losing weight. So, um, but, but fad diets are a bit like a soda, right? Or a soft drink. They might seem to work well initially. So you get a quick pickup, but then soon the sugar hits one off and you're back to square one and perhaps worse. And weight regain and weight cycling is common in young women and it leads to worse physical and mental health outcomes. So the Everybody program um, was a program that um, we developed with um, some psychological input. Um, it's a group program. It's tailored towards the needs of young women. And we sought to target the source of this, this weight cycling and this unhappiness um, and, and the reason for weight cycling, so the body image dissatisfaction, in order to help young women better engage with health and nutrition education to better manage their nutrition and their weight and their health. And so weight loss perhaps was more of a side effect rather than the primary goal of the program. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah, it's it was like a combined mental health and nutrition education program for that twelve weeks, where the young women who were recruited they came and they met up weekly in their little group. So we had groups of um, eight to twelve young women mm -hmm. at any one time coming in on a weekly basis to the university, and during those group sessions, they either had an education education session from um, dietitian, which was me for the study, and we talked about things like. Um, how to write shopping lists, um, what what you should eat that's a better option when you go out, what better takeaway you can get from Uber Eats, especially in the last kind of 12 months, um, and kind of ideas for cooking because a lot of them just that you're bombarded by so much information at in that age group from social media, magazines, all these things of what you should and shouldn't be eating. Um, and then the other sessions, so nine of the sessions were with a clinical psychologist, Natalie Crino, um, and they did things really about body image, body acceptance and coping with um, negative weight stigma. Yeah, well, it definitely sounds like a very important program and, and something that could be very useful for a lot of women, um, young women in that age group. So, yeah, that, that sounds really great. Um, and, and with um, when you were awarded the grant from Australian Rotary Health, um, how, how did you go about using these funds to test the effectiveness of the program? 
Um, it's a great question, Jessica. So as you probably know, there's a lot of re- a lot of expenses involved with doing research and testing effectiveness of, of a program like this. Um, and the Australian Rotary Health Grant absolutely made this research possible. So the grant enabled us to hire the psychologist, so Natalie, to run the group um, psychology sessions where the Everybody program was delivered. Um, and the study wouldn't have been able to happen at all without this, um, as well as um, purchasing dietary assessment tools such as food frequency questionnaires um, from the Victorian Cancer Council and other surveys that assessed um, various aspects of participant well-being and attitudes to body weight and quality of life. So a lot of these tools have effectively like a paywall, um, and so the grant helped us to use those. Um, And the funding also helped us to develop and maintain a website for the duration of the program and purchase advertising space. So interestingly, those advertisements you see on the back of toilet doors at cinemas and shopping centres, they're actually really great for accessing this population group. Um, So that was one of the really uh, novel uses of funding. 70% of the young women who contacted us interested had seen it on the back of a toilet door. Um, It wasn't, yeah. (laughs) Very they really like that form of advertising. Yeah. Personal oh, space. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, and so I guess, you know, when you were conducting this study, what sort of outcomes um, did you measure? Um, so I've, we measured a lot of outcomes. Um, I'm just kind of going through it all now and I've got huge Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> um, we did intake data. So what, what, what participants are eating and kind of how many vegetables you're eating, how much alcohol you're drinking, um, we have the Victorian Cancer Council surveys look at that sort of thing. And then we've also looking at um, quality of life. So how um, the young women feel that their weight impacts their work life, their social life, um, their relationships, um, those sorts of things there. We looked at their physical activity levels over the um, duration of the program, um, eating habits. So we look specifically at binge eating, which is proven to be quite a big area in need of some improvement with these women. Um, we looked at the experiences of weight stigma, um, uh, their, and their confidence. Of, I'm trying to think of how to summarise them all by not saying their technical names. Um, their confidence in their ability to manage their own weight. There's a survey called the Weight Self-Efficacy Scale, which looks at how confident they are in being able to manage their own health and weight. And we also looked at self-esteem, depression and anxiety as well. Yeah, so, yeah, lots of different variables that that you were looking at there. And um, did you find that the everybody intervention led to any improvements in body image for women or, or were there any other important findings that came out of the study? Yeah, absolutely. We had some amazing improvements with these young women. Um, The biggest improvements were probably with how they felt about weight stigma and how they experienced and coped with those negative attitudes that our society kind of places on people with obesity and overweight. Um, We also had some big improvements in body image. So we had the young women kind of reported that they felt more attractive, they felt fitter and stronger, um, and they placed a lot less importance on um, their own weight and their body shape. So they didn't see those as um, defining factors for their self-worth as much anymore, which was fantastic. Um, And we also had some really good improvements in their eating habits with the young women. So they established more regular and healthful eating patterns, which also really helped with um, building strong routines around things like sleep and work, which we also know is really important for mental health as well. Yeah, yeah, well, it definitely sounds like there were a lot of um, positive outcomes from the study. Yeah. And um, I know that this study also formed um, part of your PhD, um, Isabel. So mm-hmm. are you continuing to focus on the everybody study now or are there plans to add to this research later on down the track? Yeah, absolutely. Right now I am looking at all the numbers and all the data and all the things that improved with these young women um, and kind of looking at more of the statistics and trying to write it up and publish it all um, so that it's out there and so that other people can see that this is an area that really needs more research. And I guess this was a pilot study. This was kind of one of the first studies almost around the world that kind of looked as in-depth Um, on this topic and in this particular age group. So, of course, we'd love to do more research in this area. I think the next step is looking for um, a fellowship somewhere, anywhere that will have me, um, to continue the research in this area. 
Yeah. Well, well, it's yeah, it's definitely a very important research area, and it, mm. yeah, it sounds like you've you've learned a lot from your studies so far. So that must yeah, be absolutely. really exciting. Yeah. yeah. If anyone from our audience listening to this episode felt that the Everybody program may benefit them, where might they be able to access it? Um, I'll go with this one. So it was a pilot program. So now that the study's finished, it's not available per se. However, um, as Isabel outlined before, we found some really promising results from the study, both for the mental and the physical health of the young women who participated in the program. So we'll be looking, it'd be really great to look uh, into this to, to develop this further and hopefully end up translating it into the Australian health system. So perhaps through private practice clinicians who can um, implement the program in the community, that would be an, an amazing ultimate goal for this program. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And do, do you think that there, you know, eventually when it is rolled out, do you think there might be um, some positive implications for a program like this for the mental health of young women? Yeah, absolutely. I think just from what we've seen, we got, um, we got 51 young women and all of those young women, I would say, had some sort of positive takeaway from participating in the program, even if they didn't make it to the full 12 weeks. Um, a lot of the other positives um, related to mental health that we're kind of getting reported back to us from them is that they really had a sense of friendship in the group format and that they had a this feeling of this realisation that you're not in it alone and that there are other people with shared lived experiences that you can relate to. And they really had a really strong sense of camaraderie, which helped them to motivate them and feel better about themselves as well. And um, it also seems that these, a lot of these positive impacts, they've actually sustained them over the 12 months mm. um, since the program finished. And so Isabel's writing that bit up now as part of her PhD. So that's, that's very fresh new early data, but it seems that they are able to maintain the positive changes that have happened due to the program, which is really exciting because that's, that's one of the main things you really want to do. You don't yeah. just want to intervene once and then it does all go back to normal at the end. Um, it's really exciting that these young women have actually found long lasting um, benefits to, mm. their, to their mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you both are probably aware, mo most of the funding from Australian Rotary Health um, comes from our Rotarians across Australia, and they really always enjoy hearing about the positive results that come out of the research that they fund. Would, would you both like to comment on how Rotary funding may have helped you personally in your research careers? Yes, yes, I would. <laughs> I'd love to extend a very, very warm thank you to all the Rotarians for their wonderful support of work like this. Um, it's so generous and giving, so words really don't do it justice, so thank you. Um, for myself, as an early career researcher and academic, um, this Rotary funding um, has, you know, it's helped complete a major project and published data that will go a long way to solidifying that strong foundation that you need um, for a, a good research career. And also I've really enjoyed interacting with Rotary. I remember long before lockdown, we had a dinner and um, it was really lovely um, to talk about this project and, and my work with the Rotarians and, um, yeah, it's just really lovely group of people so thank you um, again Rotary, Rotary and Rotarians. Yeah well thank you for doing this important work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and just um, echoing I guess what Helen said thank you so much it's been an incredible experience for me. Um, I, I wouldn't probably be researching if it wasn't for this funding. Um, Helen O'Connor approached me when I finished my degree and asked if I wanted to be a part of it and I've loved every single step of the way and I will probably continue to be in research thanks to this and I think it's just been such a worthwhile um, project to have received the funding and it's just been such a pr privilege to work with the young women as well. Yeah well yeah I think um, yeah our Rotarians always love to hear about the funding helping early career researchers as well especially you know getting them off the ground so yeah I'm sure they'll love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, you, you may have heard as well, we're now moving towards a, a new research focus um, from next year, looking at the mental health of children aged 0 to 12. Um, could, could you maybe comment on how important it may be to continue providing funding in this um, area, particularly looking at, at body image in children? Yeah, um, so body image, uh, we, we see a lot in the, in the social media and things about body image and people um, being at risk of things like eating disorders. And so while the average age of onset for an eating disorder is between 12 and 25 years, so not quite in that age group, um, we've got data, unfortunately, that shows that over half of girls and boys aged eight to nine are dissatisfied with their bodies. Um, and so that's it's a really heavy statistic, but um, it means that these young children are much more at risk of developing eating disorders due to that, that um, 
that being dissatisfied with their body at such a young age. Yeah, yeah. and I guess I think looking at the research on like what experiences of weight stigma and the negativity around there, um, there's been some research out of the UK looking at these primary school age children, so that I guess that same kind of age bracket, and it's showing that they actually are quite aware of these negative um, stereotypes and they they believe them as well. And they've looked at these primary school age children and they've started to value thinness in their mm-hmm. friends. And which when you've already got these negative stereotypes um, around these children, it's it's heartbreaking to think of the impact that they that might have on them. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it, it could be yeah quite shocking for many people to hear mm-hmm. that 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 they're starting to develop those views so early on. So I guess that's why it's so important to to really look at early intervention and and prevention. But yeah, um, I I thank you so much for for joining me today. And I guess, was there anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up? Um, Not except just to say thank you again to Rotary and the Rotarians for funding this study. It's been a wonderful experience. And and as Isabel said, um, a really amazing opportunity. So I wouldn't may not have worked with Isabel if it weren't for this um, funding. And I really have appreciated the opportunity. Um, Isabel's fantastic. Um, is going to be one of our amazing researchers um, in the years to come. So thank you again to Rotary. Yeah. Well, thank you so much yeah. again. Thank you. That was the 48th episode of our podcast called The Research Behind Lift the Lid. It's always so inspiring to hear what researchers in Australia are doing to make a difference to mental health and how they are helping us on our mission to lift the lid on mental illness. If you can, please support important mental health research like Helen's and Isabel's by donating on the Australian Rotary Health website. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time.